coming up on this episode of Crime Family. She kind of like hears a noise downstairs. So then she goes, rushes downstairs and she finds that same man from that was at her door earlier in her house by her child, like staring at her child. So the, like the most recent theory or lead that has come out of this case, unfortunately has to do with like pedophiles and child's like sex rings and things like that. But And also there was like other stuff that came out that like someone had kidnapped her that wanted a child. Cause there was like that woman that came up to some guy and was like, oh, do you have my new daughter? Do you have my new daughter? And there, there's just like so many cases out there that have children gone missing. And like how many of those children have never been found that could be in these sex rings, like, for years and years. Like, it's just so sickening to think of. Hey everyone, welcome to part two of our season finale episode about the Madeline McCann case. So obviously if you listen to part one, we talked about the disappearance of Madeline McCann and kind of this, um, the timeline of events surrounding that and also kind of our thoughts on the main theories that came out in the beginning about that man, Robert Murat, who they thought might have been involved and also her parents. And we kind of debunked those theories or why we don't believe those were credible at all. So in this episode, we're going to be talking about potential other suspects that lead away from Madeline's parents. And it's kind of like some strange, strange occurrences that have, that occurred um, in Portugal around the time that Madeline went missing that are definitely suspicious and could be tied to her disappearance and could not be tied. Um, so we're going to get into all of that. So the, obviously the two the two major theories, like I said, were Robert Murat and the parents, but also the documentary that we watched, The Disappearance of Madeline McCann, that was on Netflix, does kind of go into a few other suspicious sort of scenarios or things that kind of happened that are definitely of note and I think are connected in some way. So there were some reports in Portugal of, I guess, around the time that Madeline went missing of these men who were like going up to tourists or they were like going up to knocking on people's doors and they were trying to raise money for an orphanage that apparently actually never, when they researched, never actually existed. But they were going to people's homes and asking them for this money for this orphanage. Um, And then there's this one scenario of a mom who had this person come to her door, was talking to her about this orphanage, trying to get her to raise money. And the mom says that this whole time that she's talking to this man at the door, he's like facing her, but not really looking at her. He's kind of like looking past her to like something that's like behind her. And then when she, like, turns, she notices that, like, her daughter is, like, there. So this man is, like, standing at the door just staring at her daughter, which is, like, obviously super creepy and weird. So I guess she, like, makes some excuses, too. She doesn't have any money. She can't donate or whatever. So trying to, like, get him away from the door. Um, And then I'm kind of unclear if it's, like, the same day or maybe if it's, like, the next day. But the mom is, like, I guess she's upstairs. Um doing whatever she's doing upstairs and then she kind of like hears a noise downstairs so then she goes rushes downstairs and she finds that same man from that was at her door earlier in her house like by her child like staring at her child and then like when she comes down the stairs like scares him off and he like runs away so that's like super weird um and obviously super sketchy and i obviously she reported this to the police um but that's kind of tied to like these other men that were also going around collecting money for this orphanage that I guess when they, when I said that they they did, they did research that apparently this orphanage orphanage was non-existent. So was this like 
just a scam to get just money? Like, was it just like a money sort of scam or was it something more sinister where it was like a ploy in order to abduct children? Like, do you guys have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I think it was obviously a scam to get money, but I also think it was like a tactic in like the sex, child sex ring. I feel like they're collecting these children for that. Like, do you think, like, do you think like the whole orphanage thing was just a ploy or like a, a story so that they would like just knock on doors and see like which houses had kids inside? I think like, so, yeah. You think like that was like, yeah. So it wasn't about the money at all. No. Or like, you're, so, cause I was thinking like, as they mentioned that in the documentary, and I was thinking like, is it possible that these people are just like con artists who are just trying to scam people out of money? But they just so happened to be around the same time that these that Madeline went missing. I don't think it had anything to do with money because when you're talking about that guy who was in that person's house and like staring at her child, like that just gives me the creeps. And like, obviously he's there to like look at the child and nothing out else but the child. And the fact that the mother was upstairs and he came in the house knowing that there was a child there, like he came back knowing that there was a child there. So it had nothing to do with money. I think it had to do with them going to the house. Maybe children answer the door, or maybe whoever answers the door, they notice the children around. I think it was just all about the children, nothing about the money. I think it could have been both. Like, they could have been trying to scam money. Also, at the same time, seeing where kids lived and how old they were and things like that. But it also could have been not about the kids and about the money, but this particular guy who was involved in this scam had a thing for kids, you know? So it could have been just, like, him being sketchy when this whole scam wasn't actually about that. So, I mean, it, you, it's really hard to say. It was just one isolated situation. Yeah, I just remember, like, seeing that in the documentary, it gives me the creeps. Like, that's so sketchy. Like, I, how did that mom... If I was that mom, I would have moved. A. Eh? Like, that day, I would have moved out never went back to that house. Like, that's so sketchy. He just runs away. Like, if she hadn't been so quick to... Like, he could have been, like, literally seconds away from abducting the child and running out and never seeing it again. Like, well, that's like the ultimate nightmare of like coming down the stairs or like waking up and like there's just like a random person standing in your house. Like that's I can't that scares me the most. I can't I know. I, I can't. I can't. I think as much as a true crime person that I am, like I'm all I'm my almost my own worst enemy enemy because I hate watching shows that have children like people like staring over me or like kids getting it. Like I just makes my like. Oh, just gives me the. Creeps. Well, yeah, it's scary enough. Like if you don't have kids and there's some random person in your house, like that's scary. But then, and then when you put kids like into that mix too, it's like even scarier. So it's just the worst. Yeah, and it's sketchy that it's like she noticed it was the exact same man from the day. So it's like she kind of put the pieces together. Like, oh, that whole thing about the orphanage was a ploy. He saw that I had my daughter here, and then came back like the next day or that later that day. To try to take her or something. Like, so could you imagine scary. if she didn't come downstairs at all? Like, within, like... Like, if she didn't happen to, like, hear a noise. Hear, yeah. I think that's what, like, alerted her, and then she went down, and then she saw him. Yeah. So if she didn't hear that noise, like, the floor creaking or whatever, I don't know what it was. But, like, like I said, it could have been, like, seconds away from taking the child and just running off. So it's super sketchy. And, like, I guess, I think it's in the documentary they mentioned, or, like, what are the chances that... Like, do you think that it's connected to Madeline in some way? It's, like, what are the chances that there's this, like, creepy man... Like, almost abducting this little girl and asking about orphanages. And, like, do you think that's just a coincidence that it just happens to be in the same area of the same resort in the days leading up to Madeline missing? Like, it wasn't too far away from that. Like, I think it was, like, a week or it was really close in time to that. So what are the chances? But then I think, like, obviously she would have described this man. She saw him twice, so she would have had fairly a good description and then, like, I guess she obviously would have went to the police with that. So then, obviously, nothing really came of that, or they weren't able to like tie that to Madeline directly. But what are the chances that like those two separate things are not related? That's what I was wondering. Yeah, that's really hard to say. Like, it is. I don't know. Like, I don't think it would be a coincidence, but I mean, it could be. Like, it's just hard to say. Like, I don't know. I just find it just like really this is a creepy, small like... sort of town. Like, Portugal has quite a small population. And, like, the small town or area of Portugal is not super populated. Like, obviously, there's people there. And, like, it's a big tourist town. So, like, I just think, like, given the size of the population, it's, like, I feel like it's a very strong coincidence to think that, like, those two things would have just happened within, like, very close together and not be somewhat related. 
Yeah, I also I think that they could be related because it seems like a brazen thing to do to break into an apartment that's so populated on this resort. And I think like that's a you know it's like a really brave thing for someone to attempt. But then for someone to actually come into your house that you like someone to come into someone's house after they've already seen you and then come back to like get your kid when you're upstairs like that's also a very brazen thing to do so i feel like yeah. in I the middle like, of the day it was like yeah. daytime so i feel like after that what what happened to madeline was almost like easier right because there was no adult around and it was just easier to grab her at night rather than in the middle of the day it was like oh this is an easy target even though for most people it really wouldn't be in a way so i feel like and, and when like when you see this documentary and investigate this case like how much child sex trafficking there is around the world and even in this area it kind of seems like well that's not a stretch to be like there could be this whole connected ring of kidnaps well that's why i think there's like a disconnect between because i think like this area like uh, of course like the the feds and like people say that like it's you know portugal's a relatively safe country and like this area is like it's like the mccann's felt that it was so safe that they felt safe leaving the doors unlocked and their kids inside. So it's a kind of a disconnect between that and like all of this kind of sketchy stuff happening. It seems like a very unsafe place to be. And then when you go into some of like the people that they say were in the area that could be tied to Madeline's disappearance. Like this place isn't safe. It's like a fucking like cesspool of like creeps. People don't know that though. And also I think it was from this um, 60 minute Australia episode called Maddie and the Monster. They, or it could have been this other Netflix documentaries. They said that at the time that Madeline disappeared, there wasn't like a sex offender registry set up for Portugal. So it's like they didn't even know who was around that area when this happened, like who was involved in sex crimes because it just wasn't set up. So I feel like it was happening, but people didn't know about it because things like that didn't exist at this time. Yeah, that's true. But also, I'm pretty sure it was that Netflix documentary as well, that there was an incident, I think it was like a couple of nights before Maddie Lynn was taken, where like, Maddie had mentioned to her mother something about why didn't you come when we were crying before? Kind of like, kind of insinuating that like something had happened that woke the children up and then they were crying, that maybe someone had been there before and like, they were in the room or in the house and it woke them up and then they started crying and it scared them so they ran away. Oh yeah, I remember that. And then, like when they actually took Maddie, it was like the second attempt, and they were successful. Yeah, and like, like by that time, they knew how to get in more because they had been there before. I feel like they're so determined to get this one girl, though. You'd think like if they tried, and then that happened, it'd be like, okay, well, that was close. I'm not doing that again. But I guess if they were professionals and they were used to this kind of thing, like that one little thing isn't going to scare them off. Yeah, that's true. But also, like, why wouldn't that have alerted Kate? Like, if her child says, why didn't you come when we were crying? Or well, I guess like, there would have been a million reasons why they were crying. But, like, that would have been yeah. weird that, like, they would have that would have happened, and then they would have, like, the next night, again, left the doors unlocked. Like, I don't want to get back into the parents, but... Yeah. But I feel like every time your kid cries, I don't think every parent rushes over to their kid every time they cry. You know, especially at night, if they're crying, like, let's just leave if they go back to sleep. So I feel like them crying and the kid and kate not running is not a red flag yeah that is yeah i guess like but also too wasn't it i think you mentioned maybe mentioned this in part one that it's like the door to the apartment wasn't visible from the table they were at right like the apartment itself was but like the door that was unlocked wasn't visible so like someone could have went in there without being seen right yeah like there really wasn't a clear view like the parents kind of made it seem like there was because they're like the way their restaurant was there was like the canopy of the restaurant like the plastic so you kind of had to like maybe situate yourself like sit down and like look up over to kind of see even see the apartment so being able to be exactly sure what was happening at every second wasn't possible it wasn't like a straight shot to the apartment kind of thing yeah but then also kind of tied to i don't think it's tied to like the orphanage kind of scam thing or maybe it is but there was also reports that like somebody had i think they mentioned this in the documentary too it's like somebody who would like during the day either that day earlier the same day that she had actually was abducted somebody had like noticed like someone walking out of the gate or something remember don't you remember seeing that in the documentary it's like somebody had seen somebody kind of exiting either like I don't know if it was for that apartment or maybe it was like for the next apartment, but like there were like reports that like there was like 
a man like standing outside the apartment for a long period of time, kind of like maybe staking it out. I don't know if it was that apartment or the next door apartment. Or then there was like another report of like there was a man seen like exiting through that patio door or through like a gate, kind of looking like flustered or sort of like agitated or something. So it's yeah, like I... r- r- reports of like men like creep like being creepy and like standing around that area for like staking it out or something yeah i saw i heard that when i was watching the documentary i saw they mentioned that it's kind of creepy how many people they seen coming like men creepily coming in and out of that like that's just creepy to me like it wasn't just one person it's yeah it's like this resort like there's people around that are not stalking but like keeping eye on that's why it's like could have been like yeah on the sixth night it's like that's why they had such the same routine every night so it's like that person could have been like staking out that apartment for like many nights leading up to that and was like oh around this time they're always out so i'm gonna like make my it kind of new sort of routine so i remember there was like reports of like multiple witnesses saying that they saw a man and they described him like he had like pockmarked face or something like he had stuff on his face or maybe it was like like he was fucking ugly (laughs) yeah they said he was like an ugly guy had like, like an ugly face like poor guy if it's just like some local but and also like yeah so pockmarked face or like i think of like someone has really bad acne and they have like the scars left behind so that's kind of what i pictured and also they, there was like reports of like two or a couple blonde guys that were kind of like hanging around and kind of like talking to each other but they were there constantly or consistently that people noticed them and people didn't really know who they were so there was definitely reports of like different people hanging around and i think it's a good point that maybe somebody noticed the routine that this family had like every night at 8 30 they were away from the apartment and they left their kids but also, it comes out that the restaurant, like, the the guest book yeah, was, like, out in the open or it was, like, available to the public. And so it was reported in that guest book the reason why that they let this whole group of people book that same table every night was because that they wanted to be close to their apartment because they were leaving their kids unattended. And that, like, anybody could read that. So somebody could have seen that and been like, okay, like, now we know wh- who our target's going to be. And so yeah. they wouldn't even have yeah. to notice the routine. Like, it was written out for them. So that was, like, a really big mistake. I f- yeah, I feel like they really, like, lack insecurity or lack in, like... Oh, uh, yeah, like, lack in security all around in that resort. Like, the, as big as it was and as popular it was, you feel like there'd be more, like, crackdown down on security for certain things. Especially, like, a guest book. Because usually when, when we go to... I mean, I don't go to fancy restaurants where I have to, like, sign a guest book. Well, now I do because of COVID, but still, like, I don't, like, you know what I mean, though? Like, it's out in the open, like, it's out, like, not most guest books that I know are out in the open for the whole entire, like, people coming and going to see. Like, and, that, and not only, like, really the guest, and not even, like, just the guest book, but, like, a description of, like, why they're booking the table. Like, is that relevant? Like, why would they need that in the guest book or, like, in the reservation or, like, out in the open? Like, why would it need to have a detail? Like, oh, yeah, they're leaving their children unattended. With unlocked, I don't know if it's at unlocked doors, but you know, leaving their children unattended in this apartment. That's why they need this table. Like, that's super weird. I don't know. Like, I remember in that documentary when like, one of the guests was saying, like, well, how is it fair that this one group can book this table for the whole week when everybody else has to do with that the day of in the morning? And he's like, oh, well, it's because, you know, they needed it for this reason. And maybe, I don't know, maybe like the restaurant was like getting that question asked all the time like why it's not fair that these people get this table every night and they're like well here just look here's the guest book here's the reason why we do stuff so they're giving that out to the public oh yeah okay it's because their children are unattended in that apartment like that seems weird like i think i could understand if maybe it was like a note that like for the staff like you know if like saying like okay this family is booking the same table every night because of this reason but like for them to like be publicly telling the guests that is weird i think it is weird. Like, it doesn't make sense why they would do that. And it probably because... And I mean, it probably was a relatively safe place. Like, everyone says, oh, this is, like, a safe town. This doesn't happen. It was, like, a safe resort. And so something like this ever happened there before. So nobody, nobody was thinking that this was going to happen. People's guards were definitely down, right? They weren't thinking that this was going to happen because it never had before. I don't know if this ever came up in the documentary. Or, like, do you think it's possible if it's another theory that, like, do you think, like, maybe there was, like people who were on staff were in cahoots with you know like people on staff could if people are privy to that information 
Like, that was brought up in the documentary, like briefly. Yeah. It was mentioned that somebody on staff in that restaurant knew the routine of this family and alerted, you know, someone they worked with, like in a sex ring or whatever, or someone they knew that was into kidnapping kids and they told them about it. And that's how these people knew about it. So, yeah, it's definitely a possibility. Yeah, that's, I was just going to say, like, you would have to know where Madeline or where these children were staying. Like, you would have to. Like, because there's all kinds of different apartments. Like, you would have to know where these kids were for you to come in, get the kid, and go out. Like, you'd have to know your way around the resort. You'd have to know, like, what time these kids were going to be sleeping and where yeah. where they were specifically were. Like, you would like, have, you would to, have yeah, to I feel like it would be someone. Exactly. Like, it would have to be someone who knew the routine, who knew that the door was going to be unlocked, or who knew that they were going to be away from the apartment at this time because it's like ballsy to just like break into someone's home you don't know if that someone's going to be home or something like so i feel like it had to be someone who at least was keeping tabs on what the routine was throughout that week i guess and know we, that the doors can be unlocked yeah because. it could have also been luck but when you think about that guy that just walked into that house when that woman was just upstairs in the middle of the day so like breaking into an apartment in the middle of the night doesn't seem like that far of a stretch but but it wasn't the middle doors. of the night either though it's like 9 p.m. Well, I guess. But, like, it's not even. It's still, like, a reasonable person to be like, well, the kids are probably asleep at that time. And maybe yeah, and true. maybe everybody else is, too. Maybe they're tired. They just think everyone's sleeping. I don't know. But it doesn't. But you'd also have to, like, know, like, like what the child looks like. So you'd have to, like, in the middle of the day, if they're out, like, you'd have to, like, be spying on them to know their routine. Well, yeah, that was kind even... of. Yeah, one of the theories was, like, someone watched them and knew where they were staying and knew they'd be away like, at this time. It could have been somebody working at the kitty club, knowing, like, who they are and, like, when they're going to be there, when they're not going to be there, and when they're going to go to sleep and where they are staying. It could have. And it also just could have been a coincidence. Somebody was, like, testing the doors and this one was unlocked, so they went in. If the door was locked, maybe it would have been a different story. It also shows, like, very, like, lack of security, like... Because if I, if I think of a resort or even of a hotel room, like, you can't just go and look and people, like, go upstairs and look in people's rooms. You have to have, like, a key. You have to have, like... But it wasn't, like, I, th- I think I say, like, resort, but it wasn't, like, a resort in the traditional sense that you would think of. Like, it's not, like, you know, like, in Mexico when you go to a resort where it's, like, it's very much like you're on the resort and it's, like, you know, a very secluded area. It's kind of, like, a that's like a resorty sort of area for tourists but it's not like separated from the rest of the town i feel like it's kind of in- dispersed among sort of like the people who live there like what's his name like robert Murat. like his house was literally feet away from that apartment so he's living he's like someone who lives there he's a local and he's living like right next to the resort and has easy ish accent you know what i mean yeah when you say resort it's not like when i remember when i one time i went to a resort in mexico it was like you you go on like a shuttle and they take you like down the road and then they open up like these gates to the resort and like then the gates close behind you and everything is like you can't get off the resort unless you go through there and like people can't come into the resort it's like and people are like don't leave the resort because it's not a safe place but but like like that no this was just like a built like a big building with like apartments around it like a pool in the like in the town you know so it was just like you could walk down the street and go into the resort if you wanted but don't you have like is, is it kind of like a hotel like a reception desk where you have to go and like see no it's not like there. a hotel like it's, there's no lobby it's like separate apartments oh okay okay it's like when you saw the documentary they show like the layout yeah i just figured it's like, like not like a hotel like when i think of like a like a resort i feel or like anything you go into and there's like a lobby there and like the receptionist and you have to like ask for you like a room key and like ask who's there like that's what well, there probably is like they probably give you keys to your room like your apartment and stuff if that's part of the resort or these apartments just could have been separate close to the resort you know like you know what i mean well it was like the ocean club wasn't it It was like that was the name of the whole place was the ocean, the ocean club, club? Resort. yeah and, and resort. i mean there probably was somewhere where you go in to pay and get your keys and stuff and like you know whatever but there wasn't like like a hotel where you go up up the elevator it was like just apartments everywhere so yeah. So yeah, I guess we should maybe should clarify that in the first part. Like when we say resort, it's not like what you po- potentially like the average person would think of as a resort. It's not like yeah, like a gated community that's separate from the rest. It's like you can like walk in and out of the resort. Like a few steps away from there, you're on like the public streets. So it's like yeah, very I kind of did say that at the beginning. I oh, said. 
yeah, I said like this part of the resort anyway, it was like apartments all around with like a pool in the middle. And then I said their apartment was right by the street, right? Where people could walk by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was very much like it's possible. Like obviously somebody can walk in. Like, And it's because of that that somebody can walk in and abduct a child, right? Because it is so like easy for someone off the street to just walk in. Whereas if it had been like a more closed off resort, it's like, you know. And that's, that's why I think like that's the draw to this resort. It's like because you don't feel like you're in like a touristy resort. Like you're actually like kind of part of the community in a way. Yeah, you're on a resort, was, but you're like still a part of like the town. Mm-hmm. And it was like a kid friendly resort, so it was people would go there if they have kids probably, and people that like kids. Oh, I guess anyone who liked kids could be there. So, but like Ugh, yeah, people that are gonna people that are gonna pay to be in like a resort like that, usually it's because they have kids. So, and I guess it does seem kind of weird that it's like if you're having a kid friendly resort that you could have it be so easy for a random stranger to walk. It's like, and if you're a local, it's like, well, you know that this is a kid resort. So if you're like a creep, you know that there's gonna be kids there. So it's like creepy. Yeah. So it really wasn't secure in that way where like the public was like excluded they really weren't they could come and go as they wanted but obviously the parents felt safe enough to leave the kids there while they went to eat yeah so that was like just some random weird occurrences that were happening in like the area of town or in that near the resort so i definitely don't think those are just coincidences that like these random men are just like being creeps and like just like staking out like areas surrounding the apartment i feel like maybe it's tied to that but then also there was quite a high profile case that's mentioned in this netflix documentary about madeline's case and it is the murder of joanna uh, cipriano and this was actually a murder that occurred in 2004 or it's i guess it's a missing persons technically i don't know it's like whether it's a missing persons case or a murder but it happened for in 2004 which would have been three years before Madeline went missing but it was also another high profile case that happened in the Algarve region of Portugal and it was the disappearance of um, she would have been 80 years old I believe at that time Um, and eventually her mother and her uncle were found guilty of the disappearance slash murder Um, but there was never any body that was ever found but the story was that the her mother had I guess walked in on like the uncle and the child engaged in like incestuous sex or something so then they murdered the child and the uncle apparently or allegedly um admitted to chopping up the body and then throwing it into like local pig sty and stuff but they never found the body and then they took the mother in for interrogation and this is like the same this is the pj so it's the same police department that's involved in madeline's case but there's pictures of the mom after her interrogation where she's just covered in bruises and looks like she'd been horribly beaten up. And then there were allegations of abuse that the police basically tortured her and forced her into giving a confession because she does confess to the murder and she gives this story. But then later, like the day after she signs the confession, she like recants the story. She says that that never happened. And basically the police tortured her until she gave that confession. But then the police say, well, no, she threw herself down a flight of stairs trying to commit suicide. And that's why she had all of those sort of marks all over her. Eventually, she did go to trial and she was convicted and they were convicted of the murder. They spent 16 years in jail. Both the mother and the uncle spent 16 years in jail or were sentenced to 16 years in jail. And apparently it's one of the it's the first ever murder case in Portugal that t- took place without a body. So they never actually ended up finding the body. So people, there's speculation of like, maybe it's just a missing person's case. Maybe she's still alive somewhere because they never did find conclusively whatever happened to her. But the mom was saying that she didn't kill her and then all of the stuff. So it was like a whole like controversy there. And I think that that's brought up in Madeline's story just to kind of showcase like the PJ and like how kind of shady they could be. And there were some officers that were charged with like misconduct in that case. So they're saying like, it's not impossible to think that like there was also misconduct in Madeline's case. So I think that's, that's where they kind of drew that comparison. Yeah. And it also came out that, um, so this guy, he was interviewed in that Netflix documentary and he was the former chief investigation coordinator. His name was Gongal Amaro. And so he's in it quite a lot and he's kind of talking about the case, but he ended up writing a book about the this case and it was very much towards like the parents being guilty. And 
he was kind of going into some of the like the evidence that they had that they never released and kind of like why they were guilty and it was very defamatory and so kind of like someone that's inside the police department coming out with this book and like it shows him at book signings and stuff like that like kind of trying to make money off this case that is a very sketchy thing to do i feel and also like he um he got in trouble for that like the family sued him and he was ordered to stop like there was they weren't allowed to publish any more books or sell any more books and he i think um like the family got money because of that like the defamatory things he was saying so that's like very yeah not appropriate for someone inside the police force to write a book about a case like and, and like blame and like yeah. finger at the family so, and yeah, it was like a documentary too that came out in portugal like to yeah. tie into the book yeah not a good look in. Yeah, and also, I guess, yeah, that's also why they brought that case, because he was also involved in that case of Joanna Cipriano. Like, he was one of the officers investigating that case. And it's alleged, or it says that he was not present at the time that this mother was tortured or beaten, but, like, he was kind of tied in there as well. So I guess it kind of just shows you that he's kind of a corrupt person. I'm not saying that he was, like, involved in Madeline's disappearance, but he obviously isn't, like, above being sketchy. Yeah, it's like he had like definitely a financial motive to blame the parents and like make it look like they did it almost. Yeah. Um, so those were kind of a few other interesting things that were brought up in the documentary, but there is like kind of the newest sort of revelation that came out or newest suspect that's being looked at. Katie, I know you have more information on that. Yeah, I'll get into that. Also, just as an aside, I want to say, like, some of the things that they brought up in this Netflix documentary about, like, some of the sex trafficking rings that are out there, like, they go into, like, the dark web and how sketchy that is. And, I mean, obviously, we don't, there's no way for us to know how sketchy that is because we, I've never been to the dark web and you, like, can't get to those places unless you are, like, a investigation investigator or, like, a really shitty person. And, um... But, like, the, some of the things they say, how, like, oh, in, like, overseas and some of the poorer countries, they just, like, rich men will fly in on their planes and, like, just grab a child, do whatever they want with it for a couple of days, and then just drop it back off at, like, the dump where they live. And like, this is just things that people know about. And I'm just like, where is, like, the mass media on these kind of things? Like, you know, they just, like... Jeffrey briefly, Epstein. Yeah, they, like, they, like, briefly mention this, and then, like, they move on. And, like, one of the guys in the Netflix documentary is very much, like, we have to get the word out there about this kind of thing. So I feel like that's something that's very underreported, just as an aside, because that struck me as, like, holy shit, like, you don't know these things are happening because you can't, you don't do a Google search and these things come up, right? It's very, like, hidden, dark things that are out there. Anyway. I don't understand why all of our, most of our cases that we've done this season and last season have to do with shoddy police work like i don't know well, like i mean i feel like it's just because like I, I mean some of these cases aren't because the police are human they make mistakes that happens and so you know they do things they shouldn't and we know about it because it's in the media but also yeah there is just a lot of things that is shady i just well, don't understand why that police officer who made that book or what that, that documentary like i don't understand what he gained from that like that's just a horrible thing to do like a like what kind of person are you? Yeah, to, it's like, money. He got money from the book. That. But that, I don't know. That's just like a shitty person. Well, it's just interesting too because like I was actually saying this before we started recording, but this is I think our first case that we've covered outside of North America, and like a lot of our cases do involve like police misconduct or like shoddy investigations and stuff like that. So it's like obviously that's not just a North American thing. Like it happens everywhere. So here you go to a go to a case that's on the other side of the world in Portugal and there's still the same things are happening, the same corruption. I mean, that's it's not strictly, like, it's not restricted to, like, a certain country. It's, like, the whole fucking world's corrupt at this point. But, you know, it's, like, the police department is, like, doing the same thing, like, following leads or, like, trying to frame people or trying to do all this stuff. Like, it's crazy that, like, those same sort of themes are popping up even in little old Portugal. <laughs> yeah, because there's just, like, corrupt, shitty people all over the world. So, the, like, the most recent theory or lead that has come out of this case, unfortunately, has to do with, like, pedophiles and child's, like, sex rings and things like that. But, so there's a man named Christian Brockner, and he lived just, like, over a kilometer away from where Madeline and her family were staying 
in Portugal and he was a sex offender and he had raped a young girl in the past and he had actually raped an elderly woman who was a guest at the same resort that the McCanns were staying at. And so yeah, like I said before, like in Portugal at that time there was no official sex offender registry and so he lived so close to that resort but there was really no record of him. And he was actually not a registered resident of Portugal, I guess. Like, he had fled Germany after a conviction of raping a young girl when he was only 17. And so he fled Germany and was living in Portugal. But there was never, like, an official documentation that he lived there as a resident. So he was kind of, like, just, like, a drifter kind of person, even though he had lived there for, like, 10 years. I guess if you don't register yourself, there's no way for anyone to track you, which is like the whole point, and that's why he did that. So he was actually um, arrested for an unrelated crime, and rather than tell the authorities his address, like where he was living in Portugal, he just chose to stay in jail for like eight more months. So I guess they must have been like, well, if you tell us where you live, you know, you're cooperating, we'll reduce your sentence. But he decided not to do that and just like stayed in jail for his full eight months. And while he was in jail, he got one of his friends to go over to his house and gather up like all of his computers, all his hard drives and cameras and get rid of them so that when the police actually did go to search his house, they didn't find any of that stuff. But it does come out that more recently, they kind of dug up his yard. They figured out where he did live and they found over like 8,000 videos recovered that was buried in his yard underneath the body of his dead dog. And so... Yeah, they obviously found that this guy, he would, like, videotape all of his crimes. So I don't know, like, 8,000 videos. I'm assuming some of them must have been of the same people, just, like, long videos. I can't imagine it was, like, 8,000 different victims. But either way, they found these disturbing videos of... And there was even... There was a video of when he raped that elderly woman. Like, there was a video of that as well. And they also searched, like, his RV that was on his property, and they found lots of bathing suits of young girls that he that were in that rv in the place where this resort was um the prayer deluge he was known by the locals for a lot of burglaries that he had committed um he would burglarize like vacation rentals in the area and it was in november of 2005 when he raped that 72 year old woman and he did that after he broke into her vacation home and there was also evidence that he tortured her as well when they found that videotape of it. And so he was like a very, like they obviously they're like, yeah, he's a sociopath. He's very violent. And this is like his thing where he likes to rape and torture and videotape people. And so they're, they're thinking like he could be like a serial killer, but they don't have enough evidence for it. So soon after Madeline disappeared, this guy, Christian, fled back to Germany and throughout his past, like, he had many young teenage girlfriends, and he was very physically abusive. And he would often talk to his friends and, like, tell people that he wanted to build a cellar, kind of, like, similar to a cellar that... There's another case, like, the... I forget the guy's name, but Fritz, Frizzle or Fritzel, he, where he kept yeah, his... Yeah, Joseph Fritzel or something? Yeah, at Joseph Fritzel, where he kept his his own daughter for like 24 years in a cellar and nobody could nobody knew she was down there so he would talk about things like that and they actually did find like a hidden cellar that he had on one of the properties of where he used to live um and so he's just like that kind of guy just like the just like a scumbag and that was kind of his thing like just like just morbid violent gross kind of stuff you know a fascination with like kids so they, ha so they have all this evidence and he is actually in jail like he was convicted of some crime that made him so he's in jail for like seven years and so a german prosecutor named hans christian volters who was involved in madeline's case um he was interviewed for this 60 minutes australia documentary and he he officially says that they have enough evidence to suggest that madeline is dead and that christian actually killed her but he can't go into detail. And so so just to clarify, like for this episode of the 60 Minutes Australia called Maddie and the Monster came out in October of 2020. Um, and so this guy at the time, he's interviewed and he says that they have enough evidence to suggest that Madeline is dead and that Christian Bruckner killed her. And he can't go into detail about why they have reached that conclusion, but he can say that that's the conclusion that they've come to. 
And he says that they have known this for a couple of years, so around like 2018-ish. And they say that they can place him at the scene of Madeline's, Madeline's abduction. And they found phone records that can corroborate that as well, because it shows that Christian was likely tipped off that night that there was children left alone in that apartment. And there's phone records that show he was outside the apartment that night in the same time frame where Madeline disappeared. So it seems like, you know, circumstantial, but super compelling. And Christian was also identified by someone who recognized a sketch that an artist had done of some of the people that they saw lurking around the apartment and said that he that's how they caught him because someone recognized him oh this looks like this guy and that's where they went to go find him and but the police like made a mistake because they sent christian a letter saying oh we think you are a witness to the madeline mccann case so can you come and talk to us about it and that kind of tipped him off that he was a suspect and he fled but like i said he was you know caught for another crime he's in jail at this time but this was like over a year ago that this came out and they there's nothing like concrete saying that he's a official suspect in this case they haven't charged him with anything and so i'm thinking maybe since he's already in jail that they have they think they have like more time to kind of build up a solid solid case but christian himself is saying like they don't have enough evidence they're never going to be able to have enough evidence to pin me to this so he's not cooperating like he's not going to confess and so but the police I mean, so he's not saying he didn't do it he's just saying they don't have enough evidence to pin me yeah right? yeah yeah i think that's what he's saying he's basically saying they're never going to be able to you know find enough evidence that it was me but i feel like what do they have that made them so convinced that madeline's dead and that he did it and if they have that much evidence why hasn't he been like charged or convicted for it yet this is over a year ago what do you guys think yeah that's why it's like because I, I think I saw that 60 Minutes thing like a while ago, like shortly after it came out or something. And I was like, it seems pretty like in the, the way they present it anyway. It's like, oh, well, this is the guy. Like it's solved like after all these years. But then like nothing ever came out after that. Like no update. He hasn't been charged, like nothing further. So I'm like, how can something so damning result in no charges or anything? No follow up? Yeah. So when we first talked about doing this case, I was like, well, that's solved, I think. Because I remember them find, they being like, yeah, this guy definitely did it. So I'm like, okay, that's solved. But it actually isn't because nothing else has come out about it. So it's kind of like, what's going on? What's sketchy about it for me is that like he's not denying that he didn't do it. Like He's not saying he did, but he's also not saying he didn't. So to me, when people like when suspects or people like that don't deny something, it's like, what is, what do they know? Like they must know something. Yeah, it's, it's like if you if you didn't do something, you're gonna be like, oh no, that was not me. Like right off the get go. But if he's not saying anything, it's like, okay, well that's just sketchy to me. And I think maybe they don't have enough to charge him with Madeline's mur- like with Madeline's disappearance. But like I'm sure they have enough evidence to charge him with other things that he's he has done. I'm just, like he's obviously in jail for that reason, but. I hope that they that he's the person and they finally found it but I don't know. I mean it's a really I mean I guess that is a logical conclusion to come to like if the cell phone records do corroborate that he was in that area around the time she got abducted and he also has this history of being a disgusting creep. It's like well then okay you can probably say like if he was in that area what are the chances that someone else also with similar intentions is also in the area doing it. Well, yeah, and one of his ex-girlfriends had come forward saying that he said that, like, somebody had brought up the Madeline McCann case, and he said, he's like, oh, yeah, I know what happened. Like, I was there when she disappeared, but, like, he wouldn't go into more detail. He's like, I'm not an idiot. Like, I'm not going to talk about it. And so, but he kind of said that when he was drunk or something, and then she found, like, child porn on his phone or his computer, and when she confronted him about it, like, he beat her up pretty bad and pushed her down the stairs. So he has that violent nature, as we know, and he obviously he's into child porn and he was there the night Madeline disappeared and he's a fucking scumbag so everything points to him and like as bad as it seems like yeah kind of like well almost hopeful that it is him so the search is over and we know but like obviously what he would have done to her is not something anybody wants to think about so it's like a really bad ending I feel what a disgusting disgusting person he, did you say there's this, that was his girlfriend who said that how does he have a girlfriend my question well it's like an ex one of his ex-girlfriends yeah like no. 
interesting. That's crazy. But then he's also said, like, if according to his own story, like, if that is true. Also, I find a weird story that you said, like, he said that he knows what happened to her, but then he's not going to, like, go into more detail. It's like, well, why would you even say anything then? If you're like, oh, I'm not an idiot. I'm not going to go into detail. It's like, well, then you don't have to say anything at all. I know. You are. It's almost like he wants to brag. It's like this, like one of the hugest cases in the world, like, worldwide. And he's like, yeah, like, I, I have info on that. And it's kind of like, even just, like, holding it over people's heads. He's like, but I'm not going to say anything about it. Like, just, I mean, it like, also makes it, asshole. yeah, I mean, it also makes it seem like it wouldn't be him. Like, somebody who's going to say that wouldn't be the one who did it. I don't know. To me, but anyway. people who, but people who also do things like that, like, I mean, there's different types of people who kill people and they keep it silent. But people, some people who kill, like, boast about it because they're like, it's a thrill for them and it's like the attention they want to get and it's like. But there are a lot of times where you'll hear stories of like inmates who will brag about, you know, doing a murder and then they find out well, like that wasn't true. They were just saying that. It's like people love to just sort of. Like, if he was really that kind of creepy, it's like, he wanted to kind of, he wanted, like, the badge of honor, as disgusting as it is, to, like, oh, I was the one who was responsible for the most, like, one of the most popular missing persons cases in the world. So it's, like, almost like, and, like, he didn't, I mean, is there, uh, I guess I was going to say, was there evidence that he was, like, bragging about all the other murders he did, or all the other crimes he committed? It's, like, why is that the one that he's out there bragging about? I feel like he's, like, he's fantasizing about Maybe maybe he didn't do it to Madeline, but but because it's such a wide case, like he f- has fantasized about what he would have done to Madeline if he got there first, if he didn't do it. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, like or he wishes it was him because and it, yeah. he'd like be famous kind of thing. A disgusting it's, person. It's so high profile. Um, but like, what yeah. are the chances that like if it's like I said, his cell phone pings in like that area right around the time she's abducted? Like, this is a disgusting monster. Like, obviously. Yeah, like I said, it's a logical conclusion to jump to. Yeah, and they're saying like he wouldn't didn't work alone, like he was tipped off by somebody that knew that they that Madeline was gonna be left alone. So that goes back to the thing like, well, maybe it was people that worked in the restaurant or maybe someone that worked at the hotel or the, the resort, like knew the routine and were like, Yeah, at this time they're gonna be left alone. So and he was like right there. It also like really shocks me that like at the time or like now that they don't have like a sex offender registry in that area well they might now this was just back when she disappeared in 2007 they didn't oh okay but I feel like that's off like maybe like I know like like where I live like that was something you'd know back then like if you looked it up you'd see who was like living in your area that was a pedophile but I feel like well every country is different true I guess but I mean I can guarantee you they probably do now because it seems like there was a lot of creepers in the area yeah, it's disgusting about how many of those, like, pedophiles and, like, sex offenders actually live in certain communities. It's, like, scary to think about. Um, also, oh, do, you think, one of- do you think... Oh, sorry, I was just gonna no. say, do you think Chris, Christian could be that guy who, like, walked in and that woman saw her about to abduct her child? Like, I don't know. Like, is there a sketch of that person? Like, do they ever make yeah, I don't release know. a sketch? Well, that's what, what I said. Like, like, I don't think... I'm assuming she would have... She obviously got two good looks at him. She would have, like... When she reported to the police, I'm sure she would have described this man. But I don't... I've never seen, like, a sketch that ever came out about it. Yeah. And I mean, like, in this... the 16 Minutes documentary, they kind of show, like, two different sketches that they feel like are the same person, but they came from two different people. So they're similar, but two different person. They say when you kind of put it, them both together, they look like Christian, but I don't think it really looks like him at all. They're kind of, like, maybe pushing that a bit, but... I mean, either way, he's a scumbag and probably should be in jail forever. Whether that's going to happen, like, whether they're just, like, taking their time to gather enough evidence so that it's, like, a slam dunk in jail, or whether they really have met a dead end, I don't know. Like, it's... Uh, I don't it's I don't just, know when yeah. he's in jail. I don't know when he's going to be released, because he's only in there for seven years, so... Which is crazy to think it's only seven years. Uh, I know. But, like, I, I just find it weird. It's like, why would you go public and say, we have all this evidence, and then... Like, why would not just wait until you have everything you need and then release it? It's like, this, we got this guy. It's like, why would you release just enough to be like, well, it probably was him, but, like, we're still looking for more. It's like, why not just wait until... Well, he officially I mean, maybe said, they... he said, like, yes, we, you know, have enough evidence to say that Madeline is dead and enough evidence to say that Christian Bruckner did it. But that's all they're saying. And a year later, nothing else has come out about that. So I'm thinking maybe they just are keeping it close to their chest until they... How do they know that Madeline's dead? Did he say that they no. were? No. I'm saying they have enough evidence to say that she is, but they don't have... An, they, they haven't released anything out why they know that. And I'm was thinking that, maybe... Was that... Was, videos was that tied? That yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, is that tied to what they found? Like, buried? Like, 
that's she what I'm was thinking. one of the people on those videos. It's horrible that like the parent, like the parents, have to find out that she's dead. But it may maybe it gives them kind of like a sense of relief as well that she like could have died like right away, so she wasn't like tortured or whatever. But yeah, just like know what happened to her. I feel like. But saying that she is dead and then like say like a couple years down the road they find out that she actually is alive. That that's just like horrible in itself. Also, like another little theory that came out in the sixty minutes documentary was like. Almost, I think the, the night that Madeline was missing, someone had reported that they saw a couple um, and they were like clutching like a, a kid in their arms and they were like, it was almost like they, they were running away from something and like the, when, the, when the headlights hit them, it was almost like, oh my god they were trying to hide what they had and they kind of like ran across the street like into the woods or something and so even though someone reported this because they are like, this looks like these people should not be having this kid, um, but the police like didn't look into it for like over a year later and of course at that point they're like who the fuck were these people and there's nothing that ever came from that and also there was like other stuff that came out that like someone had kidnapped her that wanted a child because there was like that woman that came up i think this was in the documentary that woman that came up to some guy was like oh do you have my new daughter do you have my new daughter i don't know how that's related or why oh, they yeah, would think that that's related so but weird. it happened like so close to when madeline went disappeared to think like oh maybe someone kidnapped her to give to this woman I'm thinking like if someone's looking for a new daughter that's almost like the best case scenario for this kind of thing because it's like somebody is looking for a kid that they're going to take care of and if Madeline went with someone like that then at least she's like happy and alive somewhere rather than you know like yeah wasn't it like it was in another city or something it was like a woman went up to this guy I kept saying do you have my new daughter you're the man with my new daughter you're going to bring me my new daughter or something yeah and then she realized that's not the person that she was looking for and then left and like nobody nothing ever came out from that i was like what the hell that was the same day that madeline went missing or like the day after or something right it was like very close yeah it was super close that's how they connected it because like oh madeline goes missing and then this woman is looking for her new daughter i I think that's a stretch to feel like they're connected especially it's not even the same city like yeah that is weird so what like someone there's like a business where somebody just goes and takes up a child and then someone else buys her and i mean i get obviously but like someone else yeah, like, who's this woman? Have- they never said who that woman was? No, they have like a sketch of her and they say it's like a, a Victoria Beckham lookalike, but it doesn't look like her at all, I feel. And, um, I don't know, I guess it's like, like a woman with like short hair or something. And then yeah, they said it was. Victoria yeah, like Beckham lookalike. Yeah, like a buzz cut hair. Yeah. And like, <laughs> yeah. Like, um, it's so weird. It's like, um, do they not? A different yeah, Victoria Beckham or something? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's a different Victoria Beckham. But anyway, um, yeah, I guess maybe some people are just so desperate for, you know, to have a kid that's will kidnap somebody else's kid, which is like, I guess best case scenario in a kidnapping if you want to look at like that way but i don't know that's yeah that's so weird it's like that's just another like strange coincidence that like it's weird that's like have all these like different things happening it's like you have those like orphanage people who are like that happens and then these random people who are like spotted like the day of like lingering around the apartment and then this other woman who's asking for her new daughter like all these things happening all around the same time like it's so it's so weird. Like, all, how are all of these things happening simultaneously? Are they all connected or are they just completely separate things that just happen to happen at the same time? Well, it's scary to think that so many of these possibilities could have happened. Like, there's so many people out there that are looking to kidnap a kid for all these different reasons. And, if, like, you're just in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's going to be your kid. Like, that's it's terrifying to think of. Uh, that is really creepy. Like, like I don't, like... Like, so when you look at all those things, it's like... So when you look at what happened to Madeline, it's either... That Christian guy who did it, these orphanage scammer people who did it, this woman who's expecting her new child or something to do with that did it, or this. Remember, then there was like that report they mentioned briefly about a man who, a masked man who would like break into people's homes. Maybe that is Christian. I guess if he was breaking and entering, it could be tied to that. But like, because like this documentary came out before that whole revelation about Christian came out, so he's not mentioned at all in the documentary. So I'm like, well, maybe some of the things that they do mention are like tied to Christian. They just didn't know that at the time, because like they do mention that masked man who like, I think yeah, they do, or someone does. True. I don't know. I've watched like, a lot of feel. I feel like I'm watching a lot of things, so it's like all mixes in which one it mentions what. But. Yeah. So the Netflix documentary, I think, it doesn't mention Christian at all. And so Bobby came out before they even had that or had enough to say it was him. And I'm thinking, like, yeah, some of these theories could be all the same person. They just don't know that it's the same person or the same group of people involved, right? Like, people breaking into houses could be, you know, related to Christian and that kind of thing, so. I'm wondering if, like, that lady who was talking about, like, do you have my new daughter could be, like, someone, like, that Christian knows, like, a girlfriend or, like, 
someone that he's involved with and like I don't know, does it seem like a he's the kind of guy that would be like, Yeah, I'll steal a kid for you. Like he's he seems like I'm gonna steal a kid for myself and then kill them. Like I'm not gonna give it to you. Yeah. But like, also true. but also why would this woman go up to a random person on the street and be like, Are you my, are you you have my new daughter? I think it's weird. Yeah. Like I, without knowing for sure if it's this guy. Like just Yeah, like, it's like, Well do you see that? me with a kid? Like do I have a kid <laughs> with me? And be like, No. Yeah. I don't yeah, know. Like, like yeah, that's why super go up weird. to that person? Like yeah, why risk going up to a random stranger and saying that? If but, like, also, up- but also, who was it that said that? Was it this man that then came forward and said someone came up to me, or like this? Like, yeah, is, I think is, I think is the it guy someone who's that- involved, like trying to like throw off a red herring. Or well, I think something? the guy that she approached came forward to police, and then he's one that described here, and that's where the sketch came from. Oh yeah, like this. Oh, this woman came up to me and said, "Do you have my new daughter?" Like, it's so weird. Like, why would she? Like, yeah, she yeah. Somebody, well, it could have been somebody mentally disturbed as well. That's like you know doesn't know what's happening. She's like like confused about something and she just went up to something yeah. random it might have nothing to do with the kidnapping but it, yeah just coincidental with the timing it's just like one of those cases that feel it's like how can one case have so many like either a red herring or like and also like this place seems hella dangerous like i mean there's all these random people breaking into houses like trying to scam you for money or trying to like it's just crazy i mean portugal is a lovely place i went there beautiful safe i never felt unsafe but also i also not like a three-year-old girl <laughs> or a three-year-old yeah, that's child what people either, were saying that so. that town is safe like people come to visit tourists it's safe people leave their doors unlocked like it's safe everything every place is safe until it's not right and now so people have a different view of this place because of what happened and yeah so ugh. i never leave my door unlocked it's crazy like i just think it's like I don't know. It's like, so all of the, because Madeline went missing, that's why all of these other things became known. Like the report about that woman or like these people asking about the orphanage, like all of that came out because of Madeline's disappearance. So like, that could have just be like, goes to show you that there's all these other sketchy things that are happening that just nobody knows about. Yeah. That's because it mean, never like, ever comes forward. And none of this stuff gets reported until a huge thing like this breaks and just happened to be this like little girl that went missing. Because like, yeah, if that's, if Madeline didn't go missing, like we wouldn't know about like the, the orphanage scam. Like who's going to report and care about that? Like nobody, because it's not a high profile, you know, little girl that went missing. Yeah. And like, it is creepy to think like, you know, there are like the stories and stuff where it's like, you know, child sex trafficking and all that is a huge like multi-billion dollar disgusting operation so it's like this huge like network of underground people so it's like it's probably happening in all pockets of the world all corners of the world that like so this one little town in portugal is just like one sort of like one sort of like representation of that but it's like happening everywhere which is so scary because nobody can find them it's all like the dark web like you can't get to the like it's all like a website like just think of like just like social networks like facebook it's like that but for people like specific people that have this website and so it's, it's just yeah and it's like and like nobody yeah. can get there unless you know somebody that knows it and can tell you about it so like not everyone's just gonna know about it and like what ha- and the, one of the things on this um 60 minutes episode also it was like um you can't be you can't get into these like pedophile rings and websites unless you like produce like a picture of a kid that no one's ever seen before to prove that you're one of them so you can't just find the creepy produce it yeah you have to have some new material to show that that's like super disturbing it is and that's why disturbing things i've heard that's like like investigators and police can't just get in there because you know they can't do that kind of thing to prove that they're one of them because they're not so it's very secretive underground like specific people and it's like a billion dollar industry, so of course they're going to protect it. That's terrifying. And it's like creepy. It's like, well, don't they have that investigator on the documentary who is like going into the dark web? Like he somehow got into it. He's like an investigator, right? And then he mm-hmm. says like, he's like, I also feel bad for him. He's like, the things I've seen on the dark web, like you can't just unsee that. Or like he has to pretend to be one of them and like partake in these chat room like fucking disgusting so it's so crazy to think and it's like yeah it's not like a, you can never you would never just stumble upon it online like it's like a very like you have to know someone who can let you in yeah so fucking disgusting mm-hmm. it really is disgusting and that's like one of the guys was saying too like in that documentary it's like they should put as much effort as they put into like counterterrorism as they do into like pedophile rings and stuff like that like they 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 pump like billions of dollars into counterterrorism and like just millions into pedophile rings. So it's like they need to step it up. I feel because it's like one of the worst things that happens in the world is, you know, child sex rings. What's worse than that? 
it's so disgusting and also like i don't know it's like almost a part of me it's like sad to say but like i almost i don't know how to say this without sounding like drastic but it was like a part of me almost hopes madeline's dead because if she's still alive and being subjected to that depravity and torture every single day like that's almost worse than if she was just killed i know it does seem like it's worse how many children have gone missing that are are actually in these like sex rings like there are so many children like through the years of who've gone missing that could be in these sex rings like there's just like so many cases out there that children gone missing and like how many of those children have never been found that could be in these sex rings like for years and years like it's just so sickening to think of well yeah it's like hundreds of thousands like in that documentary they have like that binder of like because somebody had found this website with all these kids and like you just go through, like that woman just going through all these pictures to see if she can find her son it's like super sad and scary and like just like holy frig like what these people are going through like kids can't imagine yeah it's so it's so fucking it's disgusting um i would say aj i do agree with you like i hope madeline is dead as sad as sad as that sounds because i don't want her to think that she's like what this is how many years have she been missing yeah like if it's been like 14 14 years yeah and to think that she could still be alive but in that type of environment like you almost wish that she's but also too it's like they mentioned that in the documentary too it's like with any missing child it's like the not knowing is the worst right like the parents every single day it's like you never know if like if today's the day where i'm gonna get that phone call where like she's been found or something right so it's like had that agony it's like almost at least if like you had at least if they knew it's like okay they know but it's like the what ifs is would be like torturous yeah definitely that's why saying like not knowing is worse than you know finding out that she's dead at least you have closure and you know what happened and you can just put it to rest kind of thing but i can't imagine not knowing just imagine being a parent and just like not knowing right, what happened to your kid like it's just the worst feeling i feel I feel like you could never, ever just relax. Ever. Because you never know. No, you'd never be able to. But yeah, I was also surprised, too, that, like, nothing... You know how sometimes in, like, long-term missing persons cases where it's, like, they consider someone dead? Like, in, they don't have the body, but they just, like, declare dead or something? Like, I'm also surprised, like, with that whole revelation that came out with the Christian, it's, like, why they wouldn't have just, like, okay, she's missing, but we're going to declare her illegally dead or something, like... They would have to reveal proof as to why they think that, I think, and they're just not ready to do that. They're just keeping it close to them until they can make that conclusion. Because, I mean, I feel like they did that for... The, well, another case I'm thinking of right now is, like, the Natalie Holloway case, uh, who went missing in Aruba or whatever, like, back in 2006, like, or 2005 or whatever. Like, they declared her legally dead, and they never found her body. But, like, there was no, like... I feel like if you have evidence that they're dead, they're dead. So it's like, how do you declare them legally dead without having enough evidence to prove that they're dead? You know what I mean? And so, and that's even worse though. Like for the parent as well. Like the police are saying, like your child's dead, but they don't have their body. Like you have a funeral, but no body. Like doesn't even feel real. Like you had like it just. I don't know. I feel like you can't. It's like excruciating. You can't mourn. Yeah, yeah. you can't. It's like where are they? somebody like, dead without a body. Like where are they? Yeah, and never knowing like where the remains ended up. Like that's you just don't know. It'd be awful. It's like crazy to think, like, as if they had, like, found her body, like, right away. It's like, okay, that would have been 14 years. Obviously, you're not ever over it, but you're, like, they could have, you know, gone through the mourning process or the grief process and could have at least by now sort of had some sort of closure. But now it's, like, can't ever do that. It's, like, it's, like, the grieving process, but, like, for, for 14 years. Yeah. This would be awful. I can't imagine. But I think that... So I guess in conclusion, my feeling is that it is this Christian guy. I feel like they're just not releasing evidence because they just, you know, don't want to release everything yet, but they have enough. And that I feel like an update will be coming soon and he will be charged. That's what I feel. I hope. No, I guess if I had to say, I think, I think like, yeah, I can't, I would have to say it's probably that Christian guy. Like, that's the most solid thing they have. Like, if the police are saying we have evidence to suggest he did it. Like, that's but pretty. Yeah, they seem so confident that it feels like a can't be anything other than that like you can't say yeah we officially say that she's dead and he did it without being that confident you know yeah so i would say like my theory is probably that it is him but i don't definitely don't think he acted alone like he was tipped off by somebody or he was like a part of some sort of ring of people or group of people so i think that, like even if they do prove it's him i still think that there's other people that need to be brought to justice somehow who are involved in either tipping him off or 
whatever. Or if maybe they were, if I don't know if he physically did it and then delivered her to someone else. Or like you said, he's probably not in the business of doing it for other people. Or if like somebody did it and brought the, her to him or something. Like there's, I feel like there's someone else somewhere along the line who was involved. But I just don't know who. Yeah, I, I agree with well, I agree with both of you. Like I think Chris, this Christian guy is definitely the one who took Madeline and whether she like whether she is dead or alive like that's well they're saying she's dead so but I don't really think oh no I've had a hard time believing that she's dead without them proving that there's like without a body but anyways but I'm hoping that like this person is the one that took Madeline and that way they can just like move on with the case and the parents can finally like know what happened to Madeline but he's might not he's never gonna say what what he actually did with her but I mean he might if they they come up with the evidence and say it's him and we know it and he's captured he might like to brag about it he sounds like a pretty yeah, disgusting was, person so I was just gonna say like he probably one of those people who likes to boast about stuff like that to make him like to make himself like feel superior yeah, and like he might not be saying anything because he's only in jail for seven years, so he's not going to risk saying something. But if they have enough evidence, they're like, well, you're going to be in jail forever anyway. He might be like, okay, well, here's what happened. I want the fame. Yeah. So I think it's probably, I feel like it's like just on the cusp of being solved, but nothing's ever been like definitively 100% said yet. I know. I just feel like any day there's just going to be like a headline breaking, like convicted or something or it'll be nice to see this case solved because unlike the like john benet case like it's so hard and when a case goes on for this long and not being solved it's just so frustrating so i'm hoping this case gets solved and people can just move on and get closure yeah at least this case there's like a solid suspect and like john benet it's still a complete mystery yeah and it's like almost it's like as every year passes it's like it's less likely with each year that it's going to be solved just but Maybe this one. There's hope for this one, at least. Yeah, we'll definitely be on the lookout for an update for this one, for sure. Yeah, so that's the Madeline McCann case. Do either, any of you have any final thoughts? or? No, I was going to say, like, I felt like there's so many other cases. Like, there's so many cases we could pick from, Like it, but I felt like this one, just because of the new evidence, I felt like this one was a good one to go with because it's not solved yet. Well, I mean, I, think, I mean, yeah, like it's, it's similar, like the season one finale, we did the unsolved, like JonBenet, now this one, the Madeline McCann, like similar cases. So I guess for season three, we'll do another high profile unsolved one. So yeah, that's it for season two. You guys have any thoughts about the season as a whole or some uh, sneak peeks of season three? What are you guys thinking? What's, what's coming up? It was definitely a more, like I want to say time consuming case, like season where because we had well and very interesting because we had a lot of it like important guests and a lot of important cases and it was just i had i had a fun time like learning and like researching a lot of different cases yeah i feel like season two is definitely yeah we tackled some interesting a wide kind of sort of a vast array of different cases but also like super important like we did the mini series for the missing and murdered indigenous women and then we did like you know the both and Jean one who was like you know that one was like black lives matter sort of thing so we have been tackling like, wrongful convictions stuff like that domestic violence so we've kind of tried to tackle important topics and like keep everyone everyone interested and um so yeah like season three we'll probably have some more guests lined up for you kind of working behind the scenes to get that all lined up for you right now um and maybe on location no i'm just kidding on location where in portugal let's go yeah we're going to record outside the apartment 5A. Stay tuned for that. Um, <laughs> yeah, nothing to do with Madeline McCann, but we'll just talk about other things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but yeah, so so we will be back for season three um, in a short amount of time. We also have our merch store. We're very exciting that we're working on that. We also have probably a website that we're going to design and get up and running somewhat soon. Yeah, right? we'll see. It's in the works. But... We have a lot of things in the works. And uh, we have some cases. Of course, it all comes back to the cases that we're going to do. And we're going to be thinking about cases we want to do. We're going to have another miniseries, I'm sure. Now is like the perfect time if you have like a, like if you want to reach out, like you have a case that you want us to cover or something. Like now is the perfect time because we're like in the works of planning season three. So you can definitely fit stuff in still. 
Yeah, like it's so much easier to like fit a case in once you suggest one versus like once we already have it all planned out which cases we're doing and then we get like a really good one through email. It's like we can make it work, but like for the for the sake of time, if you want it timely, then reach out. Definitely interact with us online and social media because we want to know what you think of the show and that's how we continue to make good content. Because we know what you guys like. If we don't know what you like, we can't improve and we can't offer it. And if you like some merch, stay tuned for the merch store. Very exciting stuff. Yes. So definitely if you are interested in merch or you're like, you want to see some things that definitely that follow us on social media, because that's where we're going to post like all the updates about when it's going to be released and maybe some sneak peeks of some of the designs or the items that you can buy on the merch store. So follow us on social media at crime family podcast on Instagram or crime family pod one on Twitter. And we are on Facebook at crime family podcast. Um, and our email is crime family podcast at gmail.com. So Yeah. Had a lot of fun doing season two and season three will be bigger and better. Bye. See you next season. (laughs) Bye. Bye everybody.